Hello, everyone. My name is Travis Steffens, and I'm the Regional Director for the Explorers Club for Ontario Nunavut. Tonight, we're having our a monthly virtual meeting, and we have a wonderful talk by Ian Evans, who I'll introduce in a moment. But before we begin, I, I just want to pass it on to our chapter chair, George Kurnis, who has some announcements. Awesome. Thank you so much, Travis. Good to have everyone here. I hope you had a uh, safe and lovely holiday season, Christmas, Hanukkah, New Year's, whatever you celebrate. And I, uh, I, I hope that uh, this is the last one that we have to spend separated from our loved ones. I hope things are much better next year and it looks like they will be. This was certainly the oddest Christmas that I've had and uh, I'm not looking forward to having a similar one next year. So fingers crossed that uh, we'll be getting over this hump sooner rather than later. Uh, in terms of Explorers Club Canadian Chapter news, a few things. The call for news for the newsletter just recently went out, and I want to remind people that the deadline for submitting any type of news items for the newsletter is January 15th, so get your things in by then. The email should be in your inbox now. Uh, since we are in January, I want to thank uh, Jet Britnell for his service as the British Columbia Yukon Regional Director for the past two years. His term is up and Suniva Sorby has taken over as of January 1st. She's currently riding out the winter in a shack in Svalbard right now. So she doesn't have boots on the ground in British Columbia, but uh, she does have spotty internet access. We do exchange emails regularly. So if you have any uh, issues or questions for her, if you're out in the BC Yukon region, she is reachable. Uh, if you can't get a hold of her, of her, I'm easily reachable as well. So welcome aboard, uh, Suniva, and uh, thank you, Jet, for your service. Those were the only changes in the executive for uh, 2021. Uh, what else we got going on? But there will be some changes coming up. There's gonna be a big change in the club coming up. Uh, Richard Weiss, our president, his term is ending very soon. So we will have a new president very soon. So uh, keep an eye out for news about that. Uh, there will be voting for the president. So keep an eye out for that. His term is up in March, if I am not mistaken. So we only have a couple of months left with Richard as the president. And one more piece of news. Uh, at, well, news of coming news, so to speak. I was just recently talking with uh, David Bing. He is the chair of our Honours and Awards Committee. And he told me that the committee is very close to making their final decision for the chapter awards uh, for the 2020 season. So I'm expecting to get an answer from them very soon. And hopefully those announcements will be in the next newsletter. I got my fingers crossed that we can get our information from the committee uh, soon. So there you have it. If anyone has any questions about anything, I, I sent a bunch of messages out recently to about 40 or so Canadian chapter uh, members who um, are behind in their dues. And that the membership uh, department down in New York is uh, very anxious to hear from you. So if you did receive an email from me regarding that, please do follow the instructions in that email about contacting member services. If you did not get an email from me about that, then you're cool. Don't worry about it. Forget everything I just said. And with that, I'm going to send it back to Travis. Thank you, everyone. Good to see you. Wonderful. Thanks, George. Um, and of course, a bit of great news. Uh, there's a, um, uh, a local member here in the Ontario Nunavut chapter who is now has her book, Park Beggar, um, available for pre-order. So if you Google that, Marlies Butcher has just uh, got that uh, all set up and is now online. I think it comes out in late April, around April 22nd. So keep your eye out for that. Anyone that's interested in Canada's national parks, will it's a must, a must get book. Um, it's with great pleasure that I am gonna introduce our speaker tonight, Ian Evans. Um, I've actually heard about Ian from many different people. And, uh, and so his name has traveled around and he's, uh, I've, I've met him a couple of times. He's an incredible guy. He's an adventurer, a motivational speaker and business consultant. Um, and he's a self-described ordinary guy who's achieved some incredible accomplishments, um, including things like climbing five of the seven summits. The seven summits are the seven tallest mountains on each of the seven continents. He's cycled 5,000 kilometers across Australia twice. 
um, which I think adds up to about 10,000 kilometers. Uh, he has skied to the South Pole and uh, among many other things and, and done a couple, you know, say 10 marathons. So he's done more in, uh, in one lifetime than many do, if you, than most people would ever consider in multiple lifetimes. Um, and he shares his adventures uh, as a lecturer and motivational speaker. So if you're interested, you can actually book Ian uh, for a talk via his website, ianevans.ca. Um, and I'm very excited to host him tonight. He's going to talk about his, one of his incredible bicycle trips across the Australian outback, following in the footsteps of McDougal Stewart. So I'm going to pass it on to you, Ian, and let you uh, 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 regale us with some great stories. Excellent. Thanks a lot, um, Travis. So I'm going to share my screen here. Let's just uh, organize this. Look at this. Oh, got to do that again. Okay, show video panel. There you go. Hide floating controls. Okay, I think we're ready to go. How does that look? Everyone good with that? Looks great, wonderful, thank you. Excellent, thanks Travis, thanks a lot. Um, absolute pleasure to be here again, talking to everyone at the Explorers Club and after I got back from Antarctica, um, some good friends of mine suggested that we cycle across Australia, and this time from south to north. I'd cycled a few years before from west to east, from Perth to Sydney. That was on my own across the southern part of Australia. I loved the place and just couldn't wait to get back. So when they suggested that, it was uh, an absolute fantastic thing to do and an easy thing for me to say yes to, actually. So... Um, these are the friends that um, invited me. They both live in Fergus. They're both world travelers. And we got on marvelously together. And, uh, you know, on these kind of trips, you really find out a lot about uh, the people you're with. And it really enhances that friendship. So one of the first things that I do whenever I go on an expedition is do some research on where we're going, what the history is like, and what we're going to be facing. So one of the first things that I came up against when I did some research were these two guys, Burke and Wills from Australia. And in the 1860s, the Victoria government in the south of Australia put up a great reward and did a lot of sponsorship for the first people to find a way across the continent that could be used for railway and telegraph lines. So uh, these guys had a fairly big expedition, 19 people. They set off from Victoria, from Melbourne, and they did eventually make it to the swampland just south of uh, Carpentia in the top of Australia, you can see there. But the interesting thing about these two guys is they really had no backwards experience. They made lots of bad decisions and they had some horrendous weather on the way back in the monsoons. And when they did get back to their base camp at Cooper Creek, they were in terrible state. Um, they were near death. And they made some very interesting decisions because if they'd stayed where they were, they would have been rescued fairly quickly or if they'd headed back down the same track. But they didn't. 60 miles to the west of them was a constabulary and it was right under Mount Hopeless. Now, I don't know about anyone else there, but if I was in a situation of starving to death and nearly dying, the last place in the world I'd head for is a place called Mount Hopeless. But that's what they did. Uh, both these guys died and only one man made it back to, to Victoria. But again, it really wasn't a practical route for a railway line or for the telegraph. So it really didn't fit the bill. And then we look at this guy, um, John McDowell Stewart. He came to um, Australia when he was 23. They moved to Adelaide, which was a tent city in those days. He did a lot of uh, engineering and surveying. He worked with uh, Sturt, who's another guy, another big explorer in Australia, and I cycled across the Sturt Highway on my first expedition. So he gained a lot of experience 
through those expeditions that he did early in his life. And doing even more research, I found out about this book, and I'm just holding it up here. It's a fantastic read, by the way, for anyone that hasn't read it. I got it very cheaply off Amazon. And it's the story of this wonderful, really unknown explorer, John McDowell Stewart, called Mr. Stewart's Track. And we took the book with us on the expedition. We read from it at all the really interesting and important parts of his journey. And it just added such a richness to the whole thing. We were standing where Stuart, Stuart was standing and, and doing the same things that he was essentially. And when you look at the route that Stuart took to get from Adelaide up to Darwin, it looks like a tortuous spaghetti ramble. But the reality was that all these sidebar expeditions were really looking for water. And um, so really the whole thing was about, yes, headed north, but it was also survival, finding water. And you can see where he sent off people in various directions looking for the water and finally made it after six expeditions up to the north. And our expedition, which was called In the Footsteps of John McDowell Stewart, we tried to, to simulate what he was doing and to follow exactly his route as practically as we could. We were on bicycles, but we did follow his route fairly, fairly closely and hit a lot of the key points on his, on his way. And one of the first things that we did, we actually started in Adelaide at exactly the same building that he started at. So it's now called Carclu. It's a museum, uh, mainly to Stuart and the people of that era. But in those days, it was owned by a man named John Chambers. And he was one of the major sponsors of the expedition. Um, Stuart had a very small group, probably five people. They had lunch in this building before they set off on that first expedition in 1860. And here we are on the balcony of that house, and if you look in the bottom left corner, there's a gate. And that is exactly where Stuart set off in 1860 on his first expedition. So we pushed our bikes around to the back where he came out with the horses and we headed off down that road, which of course wasn't there in 1860. And, and the first part of the expedition was, was very pleasant. It was um, rolling farmland. It was great roads, not much traffic. And for me, it was very familiar because um, five years before, I'd actually crossed this road. And so I crossed the point that at Gladstone, where I came from the west to the east and headed north through this farmland. We even stopped at the wonderful little village called Laura. And on my first expedition, I had ice cream in this store. And so was determined to sit in the same chair and have a similar ice cream five years later. And as you can see, it's a bit warm there, but uh, wonderful to revisit that place after so many years. But, you know, as most of you know, Australia is a place of a few big cities, um, a few towns, lots of roadhouses, absolutely nothing else. So where we were headed, it wasn't very long before we came across these kind of signs. So it gives you an idea of, of what you're faced with once you head out of any civilization there. Um, you know, it can be four or five days before you get to the next place or the next roadhouse. And of course, the Australians have a great sense of humor. So the next sign lent to that a little bit. And even when you get there in 286 kilometers, here's what you find. And even then, when you reach the bathroom, you go around to the door. And as you can see, the, the adventure is not over yet. So even going to the bathroom in Australia can be a real adventure and wonderful sense of humor the Australians have. But very soon after leaving Laura and seeing that sign for 500 kilometers, you hit scenery like this. And this is exactly where Stuart was in 1860. No road, of course. He was going across here by horseback, finding his way. But the most important and startling thing I find is that he didn't know where the water was. He had an idea. He seemed to be very good at finding water. 
we knew where the boreholes and artesian wells were. We knew where the water supplies were if we needed it. So he was headed up the same direction, really searching for water as well as for the route. And some of the roads, I'll call them roads in their loosest possible sense, were a little rough. And we faced roads like this quite a bit. And also the road surfaces often turned to deep sand. So we were either falling off as Brent had here or pushing our bikes a kilometer or two to get to the next hard patch where we could cycle. So it was very, very tough. And uh, especially with a, with a fully loaded bike with all your gear on. We would set off early in the mornings and have fantastic light with the sun behind us at the best time of the day. And, you know, there were times on the expedition where, where we thought a lot about Stuart. We came to a lot of the same places he was at and some of the important points that he reached. And this is a sketch of Stuart on one of his expeditions. And I just want to read you, I'll read you a few sections from his book, but the first one is talking about finding water and his decision to turn back. On June 10th, Stuart was so unwell that he was unable to ride and had to recuperate while Muller scouted ahead. He returned later that afternoon without finding any water. Stuart had also run out of shoes for his horses. Although he brought a second set, weeks of riding through quartz country had worn both sets down to nothing, and the constant dry heat was causing the walls of the horse's hooves to splinter. He confided in his journal that both men and horses were at the end of the road as well and a suffering lot. Yet he hesitated. He knew he was within 160 kilometers of the Northern Territory border and dearly wished to be the first person to cross it. But he doubted if the horses would survive more than a couple of days without drinking. Reluctantly he turned away, his expedition was at an end. So he turned back, he never lost a man in all his expeditions. He always turned back when he needed to and had an amazing sense for not only where the water was, but when he needed to turn back. This picture is interesting to me as well because the horse in the picture in the, in the middle ground there is Polly. And that was uh, Stuart, Stuart's horse on all his expeditions. Uh, she was a faithful servant. And on one expedition later on, uh, they were really short of water, but Polly became so ill that she couldn't move. She fell down and they had to leave her. So they went on to where a known water source was a few miles away and it left Polly behind. And Stuart was so upset by this, a couple of days later after he'd recovered, he took a horse, went back to see what had happened to Polly, and she was still alive, lying under a tree. He got some water, brought her back to life, and took her back to camp, and she was with him on all the other expeditions. So a wonderful story about his horse, Polly, there. At the end of all these expeditions, uh, five years later, all the horses were sold in Adelaide, and there's no record of what happened to Polly. But uh, what a faithful servant she was on all those expeditions to, to Stuart. And of course, on these trips, you have to be um, innovative and you have to come up with ideas that will overcome the, the problems of the day. And Brent came up with a wonderful uh, visor for his, for his bicycle helmet there. And of course, in the center of Australia, there's many challenges. I'll come to some of those in a minute. One of them are the flies and there are billions of flies they get in your nose and your mouth and your eyes and your ears and everything. So you really have to have one of these head nets. I had one, Ellen had one on here, but Brent forgot his, he didn't have one, but he did become innovative. And amongst our gear, he did find something that he used as a face mask and a head net. Now, this was the bag from my MSR stove so he walked around camp and wherever we were with this thing on his head. So we called him MSR head after that, which was pretty suitable, but it did seem to work and it kept the flies off for Brent, which was great. Um, as I say, we came to a lot of the places that Stuart went to. This is now called Stuart's Creek. Back in the 1860s, Stuart used this place as a base camp for all his expeditions. It was uh, part of the way up the road from, from Adelaide. He knew there was water here. He'd regroup and resupply and then head out again. It was called Chambers Creek then after the main um, sponsor. And now of course it's Stewart's Creek. So you can see uh, the, the dip where the water is. It's actually a floodway as you can see, and which is remarkable 
because Australia, of course, is a place of drought or flood, and that road completely floods uh, when it does rain. So quite remarkable, really. So we camped right at Stewart's Creek, which is the same place that Stewart would have had as a base camp in 1860. And where my bicycle is there on the left, there's a little rise, and there's actually an artesian well there. You pull up the rocks, you get some really cold water out of that well. It's very salty, but it does work for you, and, and it means you can travel a lot further without finding civilization. And it's remarkable to think that we may actually have been drinking from the same place that Stuart was drinking from. And um, what, a, what a pleasure that was. And when you camped in the middle of Australia, um, this is really all you need to go on for several months of cycling. Um, all my worldly possessions are here. You don't need a fly sheet on the tent. Very rarely do you get any precipitation. And what I found on all these expeditions I've been on, it doesn't matter how much you prepare, how much you think of what if and look at plan B, there's always something that's going to surprise you. On my South Pole expedition, it was the horrendous injuries to my feet that I got, I never imagined, and it nearly stopped me in my tracks. And on this expedition, it was all about the heat. We went in, this, in the fall, we went in uh, um, March, April, and May, when it should have been getting cooler. Yes, during the day, we expected 30 degrees, but we expected cold temperatures at night. We had 40 degrees almost the whole time in the outback, often went to 45, and at night it really went below 30. So it was just horrendous conditions and really nowhere, nowhere to escape from it. And, you know, it just really felt like you had a blowtorch on the top of your head. There was no escaping this and, and it became really debilitating and very tough to find enough water to drink. And we really had to plan that out carefully. And, you know, you, you put suntan cream on all over the, your bare skin, but it just acts like cooking oil. You know, you can almost see it bubbling and it just, it just didn't work. And, and your arms ending up looking like lizard skin and everything just completely dries up and fries. So the only solution I could find to this was actually to forget the, the suntan cream and just dress totally like a long sleeve shirt, long sleeve pants. But the other thing we did, we actually started cycling in the middle of the night. And it was really liberating to get up at three o'clock, cycle in the dark for two or three hours in the cool, relative cool, and then stop by 11 o'clock or 12. The only danger with that is, of course, you get a lot of kangaroos on the road, you get a lot of cattle on the road. We had a few close calls, but it was, it was fantastic to get a good start without getting into that heat. And of course, saw some fantastic outback sunsets and also like this one, sunrise. And we eventually came to Lake Eyre, um, one of the most uh, iconic uh, landmarks in Australia. It's this fantastically large inland lake. And it's quite interesting really in that it's really more of a salt flat than a lake. And Stuart was charged as well as reaching the north coast of Australia with actually mapping part of Lake Eyre and finding out just what happened to all the water that went into Lake Eyre. And this is a sketch from where Stuart apparently arrived on the shores of Lake Eyre. Now, we arrived at virtually the same spot, and here's what we found it looked like. So a little bit of a difference. I think there was some artistic license shown by the person doing the sketch there, but it is quite a remarkable place. And this is a picture from the air of Lake Air. And it's been turned into, well, actually a bit of information first. It's the lowest point in Australia, 15 meters below sea level. It covers 9,500 square kilometers. And there's been wool land speed records attempted there on the salt flats. Very rarely does it have water in it. And this was a mystery to people in Australia in those days. They, they couldn't figure out why all these rivers were running into Lake Eyre, but it wasn't actually going anywhere. And so I'm just going to read you another a very short section out of the book that talks about when Stuart came across Lake Eyre. 
The lake is centered in the driest region of Australia. The annual evaporation rate, at least two and a half meters, is 20 times the rate of annual rainfall. Here there is a solution that Stuart posed for himself. The waters from the rivers drain nowhere. Never in European experience have the waters of Lake Eyre flowed to somewhere else. Lake Eyre is their termination. The lake is a giant sump. At 10 to 15 meters below sea level, the lowest place on the continent, the water has no place to go. Rivers ain't a lake air to die. So that was the second thing that Stuart was finding out on his journey across Australia, and he he found out a lot more about Lake Air. And further up the road, you you hit the Udna Data Track, which is actually founded by Stuart in the 1860s. So we were cycling right in the footsteps of Stuart here. And you see some of these signposts, which are a little intimidating as he had to hit each of those places on the way up this dirt track. But then you come across other signs that really are much more interesting and entertaining and much more useful than road signs in a place like this. Who wouldn't buy a beer if you get free camping, especially in Australia, you're never just gonna buy one anyway. And of course, one of the cultures in outback Australia are roadhouses, and they're quite fascinating. You're cycling across this desert and, and rough road, and suddenly you'll hit tarmac, and you go across a smooth piece of tarmac for about 200 yards, and you come to this building in the middle of nowhere, and it really is like an oasis. You know, you have beer there, you have food there, sometimes accommodation or a dirt patch to camp out back. And this roadhouse, William Creek Hotel, is very famous in Australia because it was where the last cab to Darwin was filmed. If anyone's seen the film, great film. And this is where it was filmed. And all the people in the film have signed the inside walls on the, on the roadhouses. And we love getting to these places because you always see quirky things and quirky people inside the roadhouse. It's totally eccentric inside. And uh, you can see the Canadian flag on the bottom right there. And you really meet some interesting characters in the roadhouses. We had lots of fun in there. They couldn't figure out why we were cycling through the outback. They thought that was a pretty bizarre, but good on your mate was something they said a lot. But here was Peter. We had a long conversation with him in uh, one of the roadhouses. And as I said in the journal that we published, you know, the people in the roadhouses, they speak English, sort of. You really need subtitles or an interpreter some of the times for some of these characters, which are fantastic. And we ate some pretty interesting food in the outback when we were there. Of course, we ate dried food that were chipped over um, and then bought food on the way. But it was time to really pig out in a roadhouse. And we ate some kangaroo, some camel and some emu, which was all good fun. But it really was more about stocking up on food in a big way, because on these trips, you can actually eat anything you want. You're never going to gain weight. And so you really pig out at the roadhouses. So it was time to tuck into things like that, at least one of those, and maybe have something else afterwards. And it's at these times where my mind went back strangely to Stuart again. And I think about what he was going through, and I'll read you a little bit about what Stuart said on some of his later expeditions when he got scurvy. Scurvy's also taken a very serious hold of me. My hands are a complete mass of sores that will not heal. My mouth and gums are now so bad that I'm obliged to eat flour and water boiled. The pains of my limbs and muscles are almost insufferable. I really hope and trust it will not be the cause of me having to turn back. I suffered dreadfully during the night. And I mean, his expeditions were very poorly funded. He had almost no money to buy any extras or take any extra people. Their diet was basically meat, flour, sugar, and black tea. They killed animals on the way. They learned which, which shrubs they could eat to supplement their diet, but they were always short of food, always hungry. And Stuart got scurvy on all his expeditions. And he also talks a bit later on about his equipment that was also in pretty terrible shape. I'll just read you a little bit from his diary here. We're nearly all naked. The scrub has been so severe on our clothes, one can scarcely tell the color of a single garment. Everything is so patched. Our boots are also gone. It's with great reluctance that I'm forced to return without, without further trial. So everything 
everything was falling apart. Their bodies were falling apart. Their gear was falling apart. And um, then they had to turn back. But anyway, that's that's talking about Stuart and his and his scurvy. So after you leave the roadhouse, you you cycle on tarmac, as I've said, for 200 meters, and then you're back onto this stuff, which seems to go on pretty much forever more, until you reach this strange little place called Cuba Pedi. People are probably smiling now. Some people, I'm sure, have been to Cuba Pedi. It's the opal capital of the world, largest deposit of opals anywhere, and that's what's made it famous. There's a dredger there in on the sign. But it's also one of the weirdest places I've ever been because it has this sign right on the edge of town. I've seen a lot of signs in my travels, a lot of quirky stuff, especially in Africa and Asia, but I've never ever seen anywhere a sign that says don't walk backwards. And it's, it's with very good reason because if you look on the left of the picture, you can see all those mounds of earth. Well, as well as commercial mining, a lot of the locals decide to take it on themselves to go and dig for opals. So they go out into the into the scrub here, they dig a 12 foot hole, and if they don't find any opals, they just move on and leave the hole. So there's all these holes everywhere around. You've got to be really careful. So Kubra Pedi, incredibly hot place in the summer, temperatures up to 55 degrees. It was over 40 when we were there in the fall. And it's a place where a lot of people live underground. This is a house um, underground in Cuba Pedi. The temperature is about 20 degrees all year round. And this is where a lot of people live. And I can see why. It's beautiful down there. Um, the aboriginals have a wonderful name for uh, Cuba Pedi. And Cuba Pedi in, uh, in uh, aboriginal language means white man in a hole. So it's very appropriate and it's quite funny. But... That's really what they had to do to survive in, these, in this environment. We made a small 400-kilometer um, side trip to, to um, Ayers Rock, Uluru, uh, and the Olgas, Katatuju now. And it's the only place in Australia we were where it actually rained, which is quite remarkable. But it added a wonderful texture to the photographs, the, the picture of Ayers Rock, and it was very spiritual to be there. Um, people were still trying to climb it when we were there. Of course, that's now been banned. But it's quite a remarkable place, and especially the Olgas, which I'd wanted to go to for such a long time. And eventually, you're, you're headed up this road, and it just seems to go on forever. But you do see a sign for the end of the road, Darwin. It's still a, quite a long way away. But at least you see that sign and you're well on your way. And we're approaching here the center of Australia and a place that I'd wanted to visit ever since I was young, and that's Alice Springs. I thought it absolutely epitomized Australia to me, the center of Australia, the middle of nowhere. I couldn't get there on my first trip, but I did on this trip, and it was quite fantastic to be there and spend a couple of days there. Here's a picture from Anzac Hill looking over um, Alice Springs. And what we did on this expedition, and I've done on all my major bike expeditions, is use the post office, the postal service. In Adelaide, we put two boxes together of dried food, bike supplies, other things, and mailed them to the next big town. And when we got there, we did the same thing. And so we mailed these parcels all the way across Australia, uh, picking out food, dried food, picking out supplies, bike repairs, putting in things we'd bought or didn't need and sending it on. And it probably cost a couple of hundred dollars each to do that. A fantastic way to get stuff around. So Alice Springs was one of those places where we sent the box to. But it was also a place that we wanted to spend some time and hang out. I've got my pilot's license. I'd always wanted to fly in Australia. So I went off and rented a plane at the local airport and flew around Alice Springs for a while, which was absolutely fantastic thinking about the flying doctor and all those things, but a great place to uh, spend a few days and then head, head north again. And once you leave Alice Springs, the options are limited, shall I say, especially by bicycle. You're really stuck to the Stewart Highway, well-named, of course, but there really aren't any other options by bike. So we powered for the next 1,500 kilometers up the, up the Stewart Highway. And fairly soon after leaving Alice Springs, you actually do come to the center of Australia. And 
the, you can see where we are there. And the sketch on the right is Stuart with, with um, at Mount Stuart. And in the background on the peak, you can see a, um, a flag if you can see that. It's a tiny flag on the top. And that's what Stuart put there when he said, this is where we are at the center of Australia. And I'll just read you a little bit from his book in terms of what he found when he was at the center of Australia. As the sun approached its zenith, he raised his sextant. After several minutes, seemingly satisfied with his observation, he sat down and reached for his astronomical almanac. He then stood up and turned to his companions. They looked expectantly towards him. In a calm, even voice, he called out and said they were now at the center of Australia. Modern geographers have calculated that Stuart was correct within a few kilometers of establishing the center of Australia, which was quite remarkable because the sextant he used was badly damaged because he'd had an accident a few days before, fell off the horse, he'd been dragged along, he damaged an eye, so he had a bad eye and a damaged sextant and made these remarkable readings. And it goes on to say in the book that this was Stuart's finest hour, leading an ill-equipped, under-resourced expedition and accompanied by an unemployed gold prospector and a half-literate youth he now stood at the center of the Australian continent. So it was quite the move, but for him, it was only, of course, half the journey. And I talked at the very start here that the, the real um, purpose of, of finding their way across Australia, as well as just for pure, pure exploration, was to try and find a reasonable route for a railway and for a telegraph station. And so we would come across these abandoned railroad stations all the way up through the outback. And in, in the early days of exploration, um, the people in the outback brought in camels from Afghanistan because camels were ideally suited to transport in the outback. They transported all the goods from south to north before the train. And so the train eventually, when it became into service, was called the Ghan after Afghan camels. It's still called the Ghan today, but it's now a tourist train that goes up through Australia. And of course, all the commercial supplies are moved by railway. So we came across these. And again, it was a tribute to Stuart that he paved the way for, for what came later. And as far as the telegraph stations are concerned, again, they, they pretty much parallel the railway and we were coming across them all the time. We camped right by this place at Barrow Creek and looked at this memorial. The telegraph station is still there. And this talks about when there was an uprising and two of the people were killed, the station master and the linesman by the local Aboriginals. And, uh, you know, retribution was, was fast and brutal in those days. So the local constabulary were informed, they came up and they massacred all the Aboriginals within a 50 mile radius of the of this incident without really asking too many questions. Now, I talked earlier about the challenges Stuart had, the challenges we didn't have with all our modern equipment and technology. But one of the things that we faced that Stuart didn't face was road trains. And I don't know if anyone's been to Australia and seen the road trains. When I was there in 2012, there were three trailers in 2017, a lot of them had four trailers. So these things were huge. Here's what a road train's like. And at the very end of the show here, I'm gonna show you a short clip on what it's like cycling with road trains on the road. You can see on the front, they've got kangaroo bars because the, these things just wouldn't stop at night. You always knew when there was some roadkill coming up, you could smell it. And it was usually several kangaroo had been flattened in the night. And these guys just carried on and hit kangaroo bars, took all the kangaroos off the road. Of course, on an expedition like this, lunches or, or snacks are where you can grab them. And on the Stewart Highway, it was simply on the side of the road. So you just dump your bike, sit on the road, have something to eat and move on. And we all had different ways of finding the food. We all had the things that we wanted to eat. But what I found worked well for me was that whenever I hit a roadhouse, I would buy six or eight frozen solid Mrs. Max famous beef pies. And I would put them in my panniers, but there was a real trick to making this work because you had to eat the first one just after it thawed out 
but you'd have to make sure you ate the last one before it went green. And when it's 45 degrees, that doesn't take too long. So it was a very fine dividing line. I remember chucking a couple out, but uh, didn't make that mistake again. And of course, the other Australian staple we carried with us was this fantastically big tube of Vegemite, which was great at the end of the day on crackers with cheese and as a snack and um, really sort of was a thing at the end of the day we love to do. Now, let me tell you, when you're cycling across Australia and you're on a road like this, this is really the last thing you ever want to see, where a road train has obviously lost control, gone off the road and straight through that hole in the bush there. And thank goodness we weren't cycling here. And as you can see on the side of the road, there's really no room for a cyclist. So there were many times where I just got off the road onto the dirt when a car or a truck was coming. And we approached the Northern Territory right at the top of Australia. And prior to us arriving, there was no speed limit on the roads in the Northern Territory. And let me tell you, the road trains go really fast on the other roads where there are limits. And so there was no, no speed limit on the roads in Northern Territory. But just before we got there a few weeks, they put a speed limit on the Northern Territory. We thought, fantastic, this is great. We're gonna have a, a easier to manage road trains. They're not gonna be barreling down the highway. There's gonna be a reasonable speed limit on there. When we got to the Northern Territory, here's what the speed limit was. So nothing changed really. The road trains were going past at breakneck speed and here we were hiding on the side of the road. And the roads change now, although it's, um, it looks like a country road, it's the main road up to Darwin, but the vegetation changes. It's much more lush, we're into the tropics now. It's still between 30 and 40 degrees, but now it's humid. It's not dry in the desert. And uh, something else has changed. There's no flies anymore, but there's billions of mosquitoes. So you've got that other challenge as it gets warmer and warmer. And you know, you come across some interesting things on the side of the road up in the middle of nowhere in Australia. Wonderful sense of humor that the people in the outback here, we saw a lot of these decorated termite hills, some of them huge and some of them fantastic. And we also came across these signs, you know, of course, pretty reasonable. You've got kangaroos, you've got camels, you've got emus, which are also pretty dangerous. I nearly ran into one of those. But then we came across this next sign. And, and I thought, you know, this is really weird. This is a real sign that you're in the middle of absolutely nowhere when they've got to warn you to look out for people. So it just shows you what it's like in the middle of the outback. There's not too much going on apart from animals, that's for sure. And fairly close to the end of the expedition, um, we came across this sign. We were always coming across mementos to, to Stuart. Uh, we were really following a lot of the things that he did. And this is a sign that talks about his expeditions, but talks about a navigation error he made right at the very end towards Darwin. One of the only navigation errors he made where he headed off down the wrong river for 30 kilometers and um, had to go back and backtrack before he made it to the coast. But fantastic navigation achievements by Stuart, that's for sure. We also stayed at a wonderful little place called Daily Waters, a little outback pub, a campsite on the dirt opposite. We had some great entertainment that night. But right next to the pub is this tree where Stuart had carved an S to mark his passage and to let guys know which direction he'd gone in um, 150, 160 years ago. So it was quite wonderful to see these places that Stuart had been um, and camped at a place called Stuart's Well, where obviously he managed to find water again on the way up to Darwin. And then right towards the end of the expedition, we came to this sign, which is obviously welcoming you to Darwin at the top. And for me, this was a real sign um, that the expedition was approaching the end, but it was also an emotional sign for me because Charles Darwin, was born in a town in England called Shrewsbury. And that's my hometown. So I knew all about Charles Darwin as a boy, learned about him, been to the library and all kinds of things. And here we were in a place, the other side of the world, also called after Charles Darwin, which was pretty special. And 
when you reach the end of an expedition, I'm sure all of you know that there's a real anticlimax. You know, day after day, you've been pounding your way up the road, up these dirt roads. Every day is the same. You're trying to make 100 kilometers a day if you can. And it's a routine. But at the end, there's nothing to do. What do I do now? Yes, I'm going to have a couple of cold beers. And yes, I'm going to have a cold, sh- a nice warm shower. That's fantastic. But apart from that, it's a real anticlimax. And so at the end of the expedition, I thought back to Stuart and thought back what he would have thought when he got to Northern Australia and when he got to the ocean. And here's a final, very short piece out of the book, Mr. Stewart's track, the last day of the expedition. Started at 740, course north. On reaching the beach, Thring shouted, the sea, the sea. Stuart took off his boots and let the warm water swirl between his toes. He lit his pipe. He had achieved his life's ambition, yet he inexplicably felt empty. He ignored the shouts of his men. He remained staring ahead. The famous explorer of no fixed abode had reached his beach at Land's End. Again, he heard the jubilant cheers of his men. He glanced at them frolicking in the waters. He gazed out to sea and puffed on his pipe. And to me, of the whole book, this this one sentence sums up Stuart. The famous explorer of no fixed abode had reached his land's end. He devoted his whole life to, to reaching the top of Australia. And, you know, I think back to all the things he went through. He never lost a man. He suffered from scurvy on all his expeditions. Whenever he came back to refit back in Adelaide before his next expedition, he never fit in. He never was accepted. He didn't want to socialize. He basically just got drunk and got ready to go out again. When he got back after his last expedition, um, obviously he was fated back in Adelaide. Again, he never fit in. He turned to drink and he was dead within two years and, and all but forgotten. You know, he died two years later. And you look at these expeditions and it doesn't matter where you are, middle of the outback in Antarctica or Africa or wherever you are, it's always the people that make these expeditions, all the people we met, but especially these two that I went with. Um, I don't think you can go on an expedition like this without, without becoming much worse friends or much better friends. And luckily we're much better friends. And, um, uh, it, it's a true joy to share these expeditions with with other people and um, and come back and and have it all to talk about. Um, on my website, I've got lots of stuff. I'm going to talk a bit more about that, but there's a blog on there. You can look at some of the quirky things we found. I always like to find something really crazy every week to write about something that's happened to us, and um, it's on the blog there. And so, if you do go onto my website afterwards um, go to the Australia tab and you can see a whole bunch of stuff and also the next two short video clips I'm going to play them they're probably about four or five four minutes in total and I've had a lot of issues with zoom playing videos Um, hopefully this will work okay and then I'll sign off right after Travis so it'll just be a couple of minutes and we'll go from there On the road again I just can't wait to get on the road again My first love is making music with my friends I can't wait to get on the road again On the road There's a track winding back 
to an old-fashioned shack along the road to Gundergaard. Where the blue guns are growing and the mar and bitches flowing beneath the sunny sky. Where my mother and father are waiting for me and the pals of my... So this is outback camping at its best. And we're camped right by a borehole. A little rise there underneath those rocks is nice cold water you can use. And this is what Stuart would have been looking for. Ouch. I mean, it's pretty much unrideable with all this gear. I've got over 100 pounds on the bike and and it's uh, really tough when uh, the front wheel's digging into the sand and uh, you just uh, you just have to get off your bike and push it. No more will I roam when I get back to my home along the road to Gundagai. Okay, Travis, um, I'm done for now. Wonderful, thanks, Ian, that was incredible. I was um, honestly a bit anxious because I've spent some time in places without water and seeing you enter into those deep, dark parts of the outback brought me back to times when I was thirsty. <laughs> I had some water just to remind myself that I don't have to worry about that. Um, I'm going to pass it to the group, but I have a number of, I, I, have a, I have a few questions, but I'm going to let the group ask a few. And I know there's some watching on YouTube right now as well on the live stream. So if anyone that's there wants to type in a message, um, Joe Grabowski from Exploring by the Sea or Pants will, uh, will relay that to me. Um, but for now, I'll, I'll put it to the crew that's here on Zoom. Anyone have some questions for Ian? Ian, you can turn your screen sharing off, please. Yes, sir. There we go. Uh, Ian, I'm just going to jump in to start. I, you know, I loved every minute of that. I lived in Australia for a year and in our final few weeks, we rented a camper van and we did Sydney to Perth and we took the detour up to Uluru, then back down to Adelaide uh, and then continued on to Perth. And so, you know, just thinking of you doing that on bike is just, uh, just, just absolutely uh, amazing. And, you know, like you said, those those road houses are just such a highlight. Did you stop in uh, Glen Dambo on your way uh, up to Cooper Pedy? Can't remember that name. They all merge into one eventually. Of course, you can't remember these things. It's just all it is 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 food, beer, and a bed. So yeah, hold anything. <laughs> Glen Dambo was a highlight for us. It was it was like the the living room of the community. So you know, everybody was there. Um, and then out back, everybody was drinking their drinks at waist level in a pool. Everybody was just standing in a pool and having their drinks just to try and uh, and stay cool in that crazy hot weather. So that's always kind of kind of stuck with me. But uh, and you know those road trains. I mean, those were scary when you're in a camper van. I can only imagine what it's like when one of those blast by you uh, uh, on a bike. It must have been just absolutely wild. But I'm curious to you know how. What was a typical day like? How much progress did you make? How many kilometers did you cover uh, during the course of an average day? Well, a good question. Um, before we went, we had a chat about this and we looked at the roads and um, I said, we're going to do about 85 kilometers a day. And we did 86 kilometers a day when we averaged it at the end. Um, because some days you could do 120 easily. And other days it was 50, maybe. In the sand, it was 40. So... It totally varied. It was totally down to down to road conditions and heat. You know, I've never experienced heat like it. I don't like the heat anyway. And I thought I was going to vaporize half the time. I thought my head was going to burn off because there's nowhere to go and there's no escape. And you just you just fry, you know. So, yeah, 85 a day in this trip. 
Yeah, Maurice has got a question. Yeah, uh, Ian, so uh, given all that heat and the, the lack of water, uh, when you went through Catherine Gorge, did you at least go for a swim in there? Um, I st we stayed in Catherine, actually. Um, I did not go to Catherine Gorge. <gasps> There's lots of places we could have gone. Um, this was, this was a, a bike expedition. Um, and a rest day wasn't something I wanted to go traveling on. I wanted to put my feet up. So we didn't go to Catherine Gorge. Ah, you missed but, the Nice idea next time for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's gorgeous in there. Uh, yeah. I, I took a, um, like a Greyhound bus from, yeah. um, Kakadu up to, or sorry, Darwin up to Catherine. And I just spent, uh, three, four days paddling a kayak all by myself up the gorge. And it's neat because they're wild animals can't get into the gorge. Right. So you're totally protected in there and the water is pure. After you get past the first um, part of water, uh, the first canyon uh, where the motorboats are, after that you can drink the water direct from the, lake, uh, from the uh, river. It's fabulous. Right. Yep, hey George. Uh, I really liked when you said, um, that you expect that there were some people smiling when you started talking about Cooper Petey. Uh, I, I was there with Peter. He's, I can see him smirking. We were there for a few days yeah. in January of 2015. And Cooper Petey in January is kind of like sticking your head in an oven. And uh, for you to bike, I mean, you were obviously a little bit later. It wasn't 50 degrees when you were, when you were, we were biking, but uh, the heat there is, it's really hard to describe that kind of heat. And I think you undersold the weirdness and quirkiness of Cooper PD. It, it, is, it is a weird place. Like they film science fiction movies there because it looks like another part of the world. The yeah. people are like they're from another part of the world. Yeah. If you go to Australia, I cannot recommend Cooper PD highly enough. Just go because it's bizarre. We, we, had to, we had to make a diversion to get there, be detour, because we were going up the Udenata track and we could have carried on and then cut across later. But my wife many years ago had been to Cuba PD. And so I, I had to go. So this is the place I just had to go to. So we did and we diverted a little bit to get there. But it is one of the most bizarre places you can go. And I mean, living underground would be the only way to survive. They have actually have a campsite that's underground there. You can camp underground. They've got a church underground, a movie theater. Yeah. 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 And the worst golf course in the world. It, it, very much so, yeah. What do you think next? What's, what, what, uh, what, what, what's, what's kicking around in your brain for your next big project? Okay, well, uh, I thought you may ask that, George. You, you usually do, so I was prepared for it. But what it means is I've got to share my screen again to show you, and it'll just take me a second here. Um, just give me a second here, and we'll be there. I thought I saw a glimpse of Tuck T Up Tuck. You did. So let's get there in a minute here. Here we go. So let's just hide that thing. I think John said tuck to up tuck. So, so here's the next expedition. Um, uh, I've always wanted to bike across Canada and it seems now with COVID, this is a great year, hopefully to do it where you don't cross a border. And so uh, my wife's joining me on this expedition. We're using our camper van to get to talk to Tuk. I'm gonna get on the bike and ride the three oceans of Canada. So it's 10,500 kilometers, whatever. And we're gonna take four months and we're raising money for the Community Foundations of Canada, um, headed by the one in center Wellington here, but it's gonna be for all the, all the community foundations, they can donate money locally. So love to do that. It's a great expedition, looking forward to it. Can't wait to go and just hope we can get into the territories to, to accomplish that, you know? So Amazing. That's I've what, done that drive myself in the winter. Yeah. And uh, you're going to love it. The, uh, the Tombstone Mountains up yep. through there and the Dempster Highway. It's really spectacular. I, I have actually biked that way. I biked the Dempster the other way. So I've gone from, from Skagway to Inuvik already going that way. Now we're going to start in Tokyo and head the other way. So it's, it's wonderful. And that we can both go on the expedition is, is wonderful also. You know, we're, we're looking forward to it. So I thought you may ask what was next, George. So I was well prepared. <laughs> and that's for the spring? 
Well, well, you probably start in May because you can't start until the river's clear of ice. So that's usually early June, right? And how long do you anticipate that uh, that whole journey taking? Uh, four months. So there's your whole there's your whole summer. Pretty much. Nice. Want to get to St. John's before it snows? That's for sure. Well, I, I have some very good friends there. You can say hi to. Thank you. Yes, I'd appreciate that. I can set uh, you up. Ian, I want to jump in with a question from YouTube. So yep. you know, shout out to the viewers on YouTube. Use that chat sidebar on the right. Send us in some questions. But Chad, uh, Ellen is tuning in and they want to know uh, how many flat tires you had along the way. Fantastic question. Okay. If I, if I threw that out to a thousand people and they all guessed, they'd all be wrong. Zero. I biked across Australia twice to the Arctic Ocean, round Iceland, through the UK, never had one puncture. Okay, you don't believe me, right? I've never had one puncture. <laughs> and I mean, um, I want to believe you, but that seems... Uh... <laughs> Schwalbe tires, they're Kevlar tires. Oh, okay. And I swear by them, and they're fantastic, because it's something you just... I've had broken spokes, but never start flat tire. But you just don't have to worry about the tires. All right, very cool. I have a, I have a question, um, that, but that is shocking. I worked as a bike tour guide for... 13 years and I had many more punctures than zero, but uh, we didn't have uh, Kevlar tires. Um, yeah, they should, uh, Schwab should be sponsoring you if, uh, if, uh, if that's the case. Um, I'm just so uh, amazed by this trip and it goes back to water for me. What, what are these boreholes like? Like are you, are you showed a couple rocks covering them do you just lift this up and there's a tap or do you do you do you drop a, a bucket how does how do these things work well the one that i showed there with the movie clip and, and the slide was was a pile of rocks mm -hmm. and you move the rocks and the water's right there you just reach down with a with a bucket or something and get the water out and it's cold but it's very salty is, is cold, but but it's definitely got some saline content to it but who cares yeah, I was wondering about the the rivers all go into that salt lake that is that is not there. Does that are those rivers really just feeding those aquifers, which then feed those boreholes that you drink from, or yeah, is it well, more yeah, complicated yeah, than yeah. that? Artesian wells, yeah, yeah, that's that's what would happen all underground, of course. Sometimes Lake Eyre does fill with water mm -hmm. if they have lots of precipitation one year. Some some years it does, but very rarely, right? And these and these boreholes and and artesian wells there. They're, um, they're mapped, so you knew they were there? Um, we did, but we did in some cases, but we'd ask the locals, like we'd meet people and they'd say, you know, in 35 kilometers, look out for this on the right and there's a borehole there. Oh, great. So, you know, and, and we knew at um, Chambers Creek that there was something, there, there was actually water in the creek there, but the borehole was much better to drink than avoiding all the snakes and stuff down by the water. So we were much better using that water. And sorry to hammer home this water thing, but how did you ever become stretched on a from a water perspective where you were were pushing it close, or were you always well prepared um, between water stops? Um, no, we were pushed for sure because because the thing we we didn't cater for as much as we could have done was the heat. Like yeah. we were carrying about ten to twelve liters on our bikes, which is a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. But, and that would typically last maybe two and a half, three days, but it didn't because you just were vaporizing, you know? So we yeah, had a couple of times and used the, used the, um, the boreholes and um, the wells sometimes, yeah. But we never actually ran right out. And, and we did find um, a guy came along the side of the road one day and, and we were almost out of water and we had quite a way to go. And he had a cooler of bottled water. <laughs> and he was going to the town, so he gave it all to us. So we had a bath as well as a drink. <laughs> That's amazing. It was wonderful. So, so you, you're not going to die out there because eventually someone will come along. Mm -hmm. But it can get pretty scary when there's, it's that hot and there's no water. Yeah, I, I bet because that that's been one of my experience in my research. We don't have water in my site, so we have to bring water in, and and it's a very um, it's tense knowing you don't being a Canadian who's surrounded by water and 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 taps that turn on at any time. 
it stresses me out thinking about water logistics on any yeah. expedition. And that heat, you're probably drinking six to eight liters of water a day, just trying to just trying to be nominal. Yeah, that's incredible. Any more questions on YouTube, Joe? No, and there's there's a lot of people tuning in, so you know, don't be shy. Use that chat sidebar on the right uh, and send us in a few questions because uh, we'll definitely relay them. But uh, Ian, another question for you, just. Uh, from my end. So, you know, when I lived in Australia, uh, I bartended, I worked in a lot of different places. What was your brew of choice along the way? Did you have a, a brand or, or something you particularly enjoyed? No. Um, well, I'll, actually, I'll expand on that. <laughs> um, anything. And you anything that was cold and available. Whatever was going, you drank it. And, yeah. and you know, they, they've got some wonderful microbreweries in Australia now. But when you're in the middle of the outback and it's 45 degrees, the first two don't even touch the sides anyway. So then you start tasting it. So it just doesn't matter. But but no, I didn't have a brew of choice. I had, I just drank it. <laughs> Ian, did you have any run-ins with any of the uh, notorious Australian residents of the uh, reptilian or uh, uh, arachnid variety? Um, good question. Um, we did uh, come across a brown snake on the road, um, which is kind of deadly, um, but it, it, it slithered off and really we, we find a lot of dead, dead snakes on the road. Um, no, not, nothing at all, actually, really. And, and on the first trip, uh, there was, I got involved with some spiders. There was a white-tailed spider on the seat of the bike, which is really bad news. But um, no, nothing really. And it's quite surprising because it was very hot, you know. Snakes were out and all the rest of it, but didn't really have any encounters, no. I was surprised by the number of cattle that they've got in the center of Australia. And a lot of them were killed on the road by road trains. No. Uh, like, like kangaroos wildlife? Or, but, but cattle were, were everywhere up there. Hmm. Did you see any other wildlife, like kangaroos and stuff yeah. like that along the way? Yeah, a lot of kangaroos, a lot of emus. Yeah, emus are pretty, pretty scary things as well. They're pretty tall. Like if you're on a bike, some of them are above your head. And, and so they're pretty deadly. They're basically velociraptors. You know that, right? They're, they're what? Like they're basically descendants of velociraptors. They're dinosaurs. They're dinosaurs. They're they're basically right. dinosaurs. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they can run faster than you can bike. They, they can. I nearly ran into one in the, on the, in the, at night on the first expedition across Australia. I just missed it. And thank goodness I did because my head was level with the middle of his body when we went by him. Um, but they're, they're pretty, they can get pretty angry too. Yeah. So Ian, just kind of building off that question, I've, I've got another question via YouTube. Um, this, this might fit more towards kind of your initial uh, expedition. Uh, when we were going across the Nullabar, um, you know, I'll never forget, we were, we were driving at night, which is probably not smart, but we had, you know, we had to make up time. And we passed this red kangaroo that just didn't move. It was standing in the middle of the road on the other side. And it was like level with the side of the camper van and just watching us and scratching his chest. It was right. kind of this surreal experience, this big red kangaroo. But Charlie uh, is tuning in and he's wondering, um, you know, did you have any... Uh, animal encounters, scary or exciting or something that stood out, uh, an animal encounter uh, on either of your biking journeys? Hmm. Um, I think um, cycling with an emu on the first cycling trip, I was cycling at whatever kilometers I was doing an hour, 20 kilometers an hour. And this emu decided to match pace with me on the side of the road. So for quite a long way, he was just running along by the side of me and I was looking across and he was still there and he was there for a long time. And then he just headed off. That was really weird. And also nearly running into one at night was pretty scary. It was very close to dark and I just saw the shape ahead of me and just went around the back end of him. Um, and, and lots of well, kangaroo um, encounters were, were, were ubiquitous, especially at night. You know, they'd go, they'd, they'd get onto the roads at night and it could become very dangerous. But um, it was sad to see so many animals killed on the road, I guess, because whole packs of um, kangaroos would be wiped out. They'd all be on the road, the whole family, and they'd all get killed by the road train, like they were just piled up in the road. So 
it was quite sad in a way, you know. Ian, I had a, another quick question about, but this time about your equipment. The um, so you you don't have any problems with punctures. Did you did you, with all the experience you've had crossing Australia on bike, would you do it with the same gear that you you've done it with, or is there different bike setups or gear that you would have changed or done differently? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think a, a super rugged touring bike is fine, mm. which is what I had. I mean, I, I don't think you need anything different. I did. We did have one breakdown that you we didn't have spares for and i broke a, a back brake it just it totally sheared off the pin so it, it wasn't a brake so brent and i spent an hour fashioning a piece of wire a clip and a piece of wood from a gum tree and it worked for the rest of the trip <laughs> it was great i even rode it around here in laura for a while before i got it fixed <laughs> so you've really got to be innovative and try and do certain things but I never imagined i'd come back home with a piece of gum tree stuck in the bike <laughs> That's funny. Did you declare that at the border crossing of, back into Canada? Of course I did. Of course, I, I absolutely. <laughs> Ian, Ian, when yes. you cross Canada, will you be on the Trans Canada Trail or on on roads? Um, mostly on roads, actually, Peter, because of time. Yeah. Like. Like you'll never, you'd never make the time if you were cycling off road. I don't think I wouldn't. I'm too old for that. Some young buck at 25 might do it, but I wouldn't be able to do that. Is that because the trail is not paved? Right. Mm. So you're going to meet a lot of, a lot of trucks on this mm -hmm. trip. Yeah. Side roads where I can. Yeah. Rail trail in Newfoundland, maybe. There's a rail trail right across Newfoundland. That would be interesting. Yeah. See, Ken. Ken's asked for your forthcoming trip. Um, uh, what, what, you'll start in Tuk 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 and go th towards St. John's. Yes. Yeah. So you'll drive up there and then come back. Yeah. Yeah. And have it. Hopefully, a tailwind. Yeah, that would be nice. You'll drive up there from from where? Say again, Ken. Sorry. Yeah, I've lost my my video, um, which is why I'm having trouble. But you'll drive up to Tuk. Yes. And then back, is that the idea? Yes, drive to Tuck, uh, and then I'll cycle and my wife will drive the camper. All the way back. That'll, uh, that'll clear your head. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> well, wonderful, Ian. Uh, this, is, this is a fantastic talk. I really appreciate you taking the time to share it with us. Um, those that are tuning in now, uh, thanks for coming out. I'd like to give a big thanks to Ian Evans for, for coming out and Joe Gabrowski for hosting again through Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Um, also, make sure you go check out Ian's website, ianevans.ca, so you can see more about this expedition and his other uh, upcoming expeditions. And make sure you contribute to the, to, the, to the charity. Ian, do you mind naming the charity again? Yeah, it's um, it's the Center Wellington Community Foundation, but right now the page isn't live. Okay. I, I didn't want to tempt fate by making it live before I knew we could do this thing. So the page is ready, but it's not quite live yet. But check out the website. These videos are, are on there. By the way, did the videos play okay or were they a bit jumpy and quirky? Well enough. They were okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. yeah. So stay tuned to, on Ian's website so you can pay attention to his future expedition. And uh, thank you all for coming out and uh, have a happy new year. Great. Thanks, Travis. Thanks, everyone. Happy new year, everyone.